take a look at this perfect headline for the age of surveillance. No morsel too minuscule for all-consuming NSA. There it's set above a chilling account by New York Times reporter Scott Shane of how spying by the National Security Agency has spread like a contagious virus. And there's more. Another Times article reports that the CIA has been paying AT&T more than $10 million a year for access to its telephone records. Gives new meaning to the phone company's old slogan, reach out and touch someone. True, it's a dangerous world out there and someone has to keep an eye on it. But if you think that the only targets of illicit snooping are suspected terrorists, foreign dignitaries, and journalists too close to the truth, guess again. Every one of us is under the omniscient magnifying glass of government and corporate spies. Yes, remember the corporations. Their data banks cover every sector of American society, aimed, as the forward to a new book notes, at school children and mothers of school children, at church congregations, credit card members, and Facebook friends, at everybody and anybody at work or at play with the tracking device otherwise known as a cell phone. How do we respond to this smog of surveillance? Well, start by reading this book, Spying on Democracy, Government Surveillance, Corporate Power, and Public Resistance by Heidi Bogosian. She's executive director of the National Lawyers Guild. That's a progressive legal organization started almost 80 years ago as an alternative to the more establishment American Bar Association. She's collected story after story of how innocent lives are turned upside down. Even her own group has been subjected to surveillance and eavesdropping. Heidi Bogosian, welcome. It's an honor to be here. You say in your book that we've become a surveillance state a government-corporate partnership that makes a mockery of civil liberties. Talk about that partnership. There's a revolving door, really, between the Pentagon and private business. There's a revolving door, really, between the Pentagon and private business. For example, I think it's 70% of retired three- and four-star generals uh, then take jobs in the private sector as consultants. Uh, advising the government through work with companies such as Raytheon uh, and others about policy. Uh, and I think that's a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. But more importantly, CEOs from many of the big uh, businesses like Boeing, Raytheon, advise the president on matters of technology and national security. And they're, they're conflicted out because their profit motive really is the duty that they have, whereas the government officials have a duty to uphold the Constitution. I don't think that having 70 percent, 70 percent, 70 percent of our national intelligence conducted by private business uh, is a way to ensure that our civil liberties are really protected. You write in here that from the moment you wake up, your everyday activities are routinely subjected to surveillance. Do you think everyday Americans know that? They didn't a few months ago. Uh, I think that with the Snowden revelations and the Guardian coming forth, uh, we have a greater sense of the extent to which our communications are monitored. Uh, in fact, it seems not to be the exception, but rather the rule. Yeah, Literally the, everything is gathered. It's what you call a staggeringly comprehensive network tracks where we go, how long we stay, and what we browse, read, buy, and say. That's pretty exhaustive. It's exhaustive, and I think when the government says, for example, that metadata uh, that doesn't collect the contents of our communications uh, is an acceptable thing to collect, you have to realize that associations can be very easily garnered and tracked. What's metadata? Metadata shows, for example, that I called you on a Friday night. It doesn't say what we discussed, but it says that we talked. So that if I called a physician, say at a cancer clinic several times, uh, the government might surmise that I have cancer. Or if I engage in a certain political activity over a period of time, it allows them to develop a profile even though they don't know exactly what we discussed. What would they want that for? Well. Retailers want that information because they want to develop profiles about our purchasing and spending habits. 
We have groups such as Axiom, which is a data aggregator. Data aggregator. Data aggregator. That really has quite complete profiles on many of us in this country. That's a market research firm, right? It's a market research firm, and they very cleverly recently came out with a website called About the Data that allows you to go on and check what information they have about you and to correct it, therefore giving them actually more accurate information if you were to do that. Where do they get that data? They get the information from a number of public sources, uh, but they also go to retailers and may purchase it from, say, J.C. Penney, who has tracked what you've purchased from them mm. over the last year. And then they sell it to third-party companies, including the U.S. government. <laughs> and then they sell it to third-party companies, including the U.S. government. The U.S. government. The U.S. government. The problem being, of course, that they need to simplify profiles of us. They may categorize us as sort of an up-and-coming 20-year-old interested in uh, maybe starting a family or you're about to retire. But they also put in information about your political activities. Political activities. Political activities. Your personal interests, uh, health interests, things that we may not want shared. This is the company I think Natasha Singer wrote about in the New York Times and she said, that Axiom peers deeper into American life than the FBI or the IRS. Quote, if you are an American adult, the odds are that it knows things like your age, race, sex, weight, height, marital status, education level, politics, buying habits, household health worries, vacation dreams, and so on. Why does our government contract with a market researcher? Why does our, why does our, why does our government contract with a market researcher? Well, the government is constricted by the Fourth Amendment's uh, provision that it may not engage in unreasonable searches and seizures. But businesses don't have those same constraints. Businesses don't have those same constraints. Businesses don't have those same constraints. So they can collect information about us that the government lawfully is not allowed to do. So you have said in here that data mining is the gold standard for spying on democracy now. Explain that. Well, as we've become an increasingly consumerized nation and reliant on the internet, uh, you'll know that when you do a search, for example, for a pair of shoes, you're going to be bombarded on the internet yeah. with other shoes um, from different companies. And I think that it's become hugely profitable for these organizations such as Axiom and others because they really keep this information for years on end. We don't know exactly what they do with it, but we do know that they profit handsomely from it and that really information in this country, personal information is the new commodity. Personal information is the new commodity. People need to know that for all intents and purposes, the distinction right now between government and the corporate world is virtually nil. The distinction right now between government and the corporate world is virtually nil. Virtually nil. Virtually nil. They are hand in hand working to gather information about Americans as well as people across the globe to really be in a race uh, to collect more information than any other country can because I think in their eyes having this information, storing it and be, being able to access it for years on end is, is a symbol of power and control, 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 control. So that you can't really make that distinction anymore between big business and government. You can't really make that distinction anymore between big business and government. But they're also looking to quiet those individuals who may be critical of corporate policies. But they're also looking to quiet, quiet, quiet those individuals who may be critical, critical, critical of corporate policies. And remembering how much corporations really factor into our daily lives, that should be of concern. Uh, many corporations have their own intelligence sections, for example. <laughs> Many corporations have their own intelligence sections. For example, uh, so that they may have a unit that spies on activists, a unit 
that spies on activists, spies on activists. Spies on activists. Animal rights and environmental activists are one of the prime targets because the FBI has labeled them a top domestic terrorism threat. So that if you go to a protest and you're an animal rights activist, you can expect that you're being tracked in one way or another. The National Lawyers Guild gets calls all the time about people whose families and friends have been visited by the FBI in advance of a certain, say, Republican National Convention or another demonstration wanting to know information about certain activists. Uh, they definitely have files. They, they circulate photographs. They now identify what they call the anarchist threat. Yeah. And that's basically anyone who uh, I think uh, may be continuously critical of, of government and corporate policies, who speaks out and who isn't intimidated by corporations. So they spend vast amounts of money to track these individuals. They spend vast amounts of money to track these individuals. Track these individuals. Track these individuals. So this is why you write that corporations no longer spy merely to protect or steal trade secrets. In 2004, the Department of Homeland Security created what are called fusion centers, allegedly to better uh, streamline the coordination between local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, and businesses, so that these some 75 centers across the country work hand in hand with businesses, gathering information uh, about local threat assessments, including uh, anarchist and so-called activists, threat assessments. We saw that with the Occupy movement, where the Department of Homeland Security worked with financial uh, businesses and banks to let them know that there would be protests in their municipalities all around the country, well before the protests started. But you say this has a fallout on, on dissent and uh, truth-telling? When you are afraid to go, for example, to a mass assembly because you know that law enforcement will be there in riot gear with so-called less lethal munitions, when you know that corporations have done their research, gathered dossiers on you, may have their own private security guards as they do now at most protests, uh, it makes people who maybe have never gone to a protest before, who want to express a view on something, afraid of that. I think that's very uh, damaging to the notion of democracy because the streets, the public parks, which are now increasingly uh, corporatized in many urban areas, uh, don't belong to us as a people anymore. They belong to corporations. And if we're afraid to go there and congregate, uh, it's a sad testament to where we are. Spying on democracy, government surveillance, corporate power, and public resistance. Hadi Boghossian, thank you very much for being with me. Thank you so much.